All right. Well, if you have been with us, we've been going through the book of James together. Uh, as I mentioned before, James is the half brother of Jesus. And so it's um, very interesting in your face, short letter. And so we're going to continue in James chapter three, verses one through 12. And uh, I just want to say up front, this is probably one of the most challenging passages for me and probably for many of us as Jesus, uh, James is going to talk about our tongue and words. And so we're going to start at verse one and James writes, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouth of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large, are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring uh, pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or grapevine produce fig figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer before we go into God's word together. Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for the reminder of your grace that once we were dead in our trespasses and sin, and yet because of your unrelenting love that you give us life and hope beyond the grave, uh, we pray again, once again, for this nation as we have our elections coming up. Uh, we just really pray for your guidance and wisdom. Remind us, especially for those who are in Jesus Christ, that our citizenship ultimately is in heaven. And God, you are sovereign over nations. You are sovereign over this country. And so we do pray that we would do our due diligence to elect uh, the, the right people that you put in our hearts. But we also do pray that whoever leads this country uh, would lead it with uh, godly wisdom and that God, you would impart them and just give them um, knowledge and direction uh, that comes from you. And so Lord, even as we go into your word, we pray that you will convict us, especially as we talk about our words. Uh, we pray that you would help us through the guidance of your Holy Spirit to uh, not only change our words, but ultimately change our hearts because that's what we need. And so we come under the authority of the Holy Spirit we asked for your dependence during this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, a few years ago, after a Sunday service, a young lady came up to me and she was asking me to pray for her because she recently lost her job. And she was sharing with me how she was anxious, uh, but also uh, really asking that I could pray for her for provision as she had a rent to pay and bills to pay. And so I prayed for her. And then a few weeks later after that, um, I asked her, uh, or no, I just forgot, uh, how are things going at your job? And it was one of those moments as I spoke those words, I just instantly remembered that this young lady had just lost her job. And fortunately, she was gracious about it. And I share that this morning because I think all of us here in this room have had times where we regret saying something or we lost control of the things we wanted to say and it leads to very awkward and sometimes difficult situations. And in today's passage, as we just read, James is gonna talk about the topic of our tongue or specifically the words that we speak. When it comes to our words, I don't know if you knew this, but the average person speaks about 15,000 words per day. 
Now, in the same stat, it also said that women speak a little bit more than men. That average is about one-fifth of our lives speaking. If you put that in context, in a lifetime, we speak close to a billion words, 860 million to be exact. And if you were to kind of condense that down, that's an entire set of a 20-volume Oxford English Dictionary 15 times. My point is, we use a lot of words. We talk to ourselves. We talk to others. We communicate our thoughts and what we think constantly. We have digital platforms now now where we communicate through text and other means. And through our communication, what James is saying is that we need wisdom. James is going to talk about the importance of wisdom when it comes to our words. Now, throughout the book of James, I've been saying that there is a difference between a profession of faith and how we uh, possess our faith. Meaning that James, what he's writing about is that all of us here who have made a profession of faith, there's always a disconnect in how we live. And so he's trying to put those two together and saying, if you believe in Jesus Christ, it should reflect in very different, our lives should reflect in very specific ways. If you remember, he talked about how we should view trials, how we should not only be hearers of the word, but to also be doers of the word. We last week, we talked about faith and works, how if our faith is authentic, it would be visible through our works. And today I just want to boil this whole message down into one sentence. And it would be this, that authentic faith would show itself in practically in the way that we use our words. That's what James's whole point is throughout these verses. The way that you and I speak and communicate and share our words should reflect what we believe in when it comes to the gospel. The importance and seriousness of our words is what James is getting at. Now, I love James because he uses, he uses these illustrations. Now, if in these ver- verses, he uses the illustration of a bit on a horse, a ship on a rudder, fire, taming animals, spring, fruit, trees, salt ponds, and he's going to make a point. And the point is that words are powerful. So therefore we must learn to control or tame our tongue. And so as we look at this passage, we want to look at it in three headings. And the first one is this, the tongue has incredible power. The tongue has incredible power. James starts this passage by talking about teachers and he gives a serious warning. And what he says is that teachers should be careful because of the words they use. James is going to address people, especially who have influence through their words because they will be kept accountable. He's not forbidding anyone to teach, but he's showing that our words have power to influence. It made me just think about my job and what I do every single Sunday. And it really helped me to come with the attitude of humility because every single word that I say matters. But I just also want to say that all of us to some degree, whether right now or later on in life, we will also be teachers in some kind of way. If you think about it, if you are a Christian parent, you will probably Be a teacher to your children. Maybe some of us will be a small group leader or some kind of leader in some kind of way. You will also be in a position of leadership. If you are discipling someone, you are using your words to communicate. And so James's whole point is people of influence should be careful in the way that they use their words. Jesus also has a lot to say when it comes to our words. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 to 37, this is what he says. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give accounts for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. What Jesus is saying that every single word that you and I speak, we will have to give an account. Our words matter. That's what James is saying. And then he uses these two little 
punchy illustrations. First, he's going to talk about a bit on a horse. If you think about a horse, a horse can range between 800 to 2,000 pounds. And James's whole point is, if you think about a bit on a horse that goes around its mouth, with this small, tiny object, you have control over this massive animal. I went horseback riding one time in my life, on my honeymoon, and it was astounding. Because if you control the bit, if you move it left and right, you can move this massive animal and direct it to where you want it to go. Then he uses the illustration of a ship. These ships, ships are massive. And James is saying that ships are controlled by this small little rudder. And his point is that these massive, massive objects are controlled by something very small. And in the same way that James is saying, our tongue, which is a very small muscle, also controls our entire body. Our words are far more powerful than we think. If you think about the words in our life, we're spoken to our life. I believe that our words to this very day have, um, have uh, shaped our couple things, our self-image and our identity. If you think about the words that have been spoken to us, all the words that have been compiled and been spoken to us, both positively and negatively, probably shape us today in some way or another. Think about words that have changed your life. Maybe words like, I love you. I'm proud of you. We want you. Maybe negative words like, you're not very good. We're going in a different direction. I want to break up with you. Your best relationships came through words and your most strange relationships also came through words. And so James's whole point is that words are very powerful. The proverb writer in Proverbs 12, 18 puts it like this. Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. So words can either give life or it can take life. Words can either nourish or destroy. They can either help or to hurt. And in James chapter three, James is telling his writers, we need to wake up because our words have power. Don't be naive about the words that you and I speak. Don't underestimate the weightiness of our speech and our tongue. That's James's entire point. Greg Troxel, I believe that's how you say his name in his commentary, puts it like this. I love the way that he says this. He says, the eyes and ears are the gatekeepers of our hearts and our tongues are our heart's ambassadors. What we have laid up in our hearts cannot stay there. What's inside of me cannot be kept inside me. If I have a big heart, then you will hear patient words. If I have a bruised heart, you will hear hurting and hurtful words. If I have an empty heart, you'll hear loud and hollow words. If I have a wise heart, you will hear sound words. Who we speak as people is much more visible to others than we may realize. And it is all displayed in the kinds of words we speak. And so I think all of us can agree that our words are powerful. Our words have influence. And that's why James says we ought to be careful in the words that we speak. Second, the tongue is nearly impossible to tame. The tongue is nearly impossible to tame. I'm going to read verses five and six for us again. James says, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the whole course of life and set on by fire by hell. And so James is going to continue with this illustration of the destructiveness of our tongue. And he gives this illustration of a fire. And he's saying by one small word that you and I can say, we can destroy an entire life. I'm sure many of us have heard the Maui fires last year, August of 2023. And if you read news reports on the Maui fires, it all came because of the severed power line. 
And if you, there's actually videos on YouTube of how this severed power line just started with this small brush fire. And then it started to increase. And later on, it just caught on all throughout the mountainside. And after it was all said and done, reports say that 102 people were killed. More than 2,200 structures were damaged. And get this, over $5 billion worth of damages were done all by a tiny spark. Something small, so small can cause massive destruction. Think about the words that can be so damaging in our lives. Words of slander and gossip. It can come in the form of criticism or sarcasm, lying, boasting, words of anger and hate. If you think about the destruction that may have come in through your life, it's probably some of these kind of words, maybe hateful words, words that have uh, affected you, maybe even traumatized you to this day. If you think about our relationships, think about the relationships that can either make or break through the power of words. Some of our friendships have been stained because of lying or maybe betrayal because words have been used in a specific way. Marriages have been destroyed or either made better through words. My wife and I have been doing a lot of premarital counseling. And one of the sections that we always go over is communication because words matter. Words either break or make a marriage. You think about families. Families can either come together or be estranged by the power of words. Communities are built or broken through words. Wrong words or hurtful words can destroy an entire church community. I believe that's one of the reasons why James is addressing the importance of words. Church division and splits come through words. Maybe even as I'm speaking this morning, some of us are thinking or maybe recalling words that have been said to us that are traumatizing even to this day. Even throughout this message, I was in a state of repentance of the words that I've spoken to my wife and my children and friends throughout the years. And so James is saying we ought to be careful. And then he continues on and he says that every single animal has been tamed, but no one can tame the tongue. Verse seven, for every kind of beast and birds of reptiles and sea creatures can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. I love this analogy that James gives. He's saying every creature on this earth to some degree has been tamed, and yet the human tongue cannot be tamed. I did a quick YouTube search on tamed animals this past week. It is astounding the kind of animals that humans have tamed. Cobras can swing and dance to music. I'm sure we've seen this. Uh, there was this one lion trainer who put his entire head in the mouth of a lion. Now, I don't know why he would, <laughs> what would cause him to do something like this, but I just saw this imagery of this lion tamer training this lion. Killer whales can swim with children today. And I can go on and on and on about all the tamed animals that you and I see almost on a day-to-day -day basis. I saw, I think the greatest example of this last year, I was able to go to a football game in Philadelphia and right before the start of the game, they released this eagle. I believe I have a picture of it, if you could show this picture. I don't know if you could see this picture. But this eagle is named Independence, obviously for the city of Philadelphia. And right before the game, this eagle was let go at the very top of the stadium, right where the broadcaster's booth is. And it was amazing because this eagle flew around this entire stadium with thousands and thousands of people and eventually landed on the arm of its trainer. It was astounding because out of all the thousands of people that this eagle was flying over, it was able to find its trainer. 
I share this again because every beast is tamed. But James is saying no one can tame the human tongue. In verses 8, he goes on and he says, The tongue is a world of unrighteousness filled with poison. It is a restless evil. What he's saying is that through our words, if we're not careful, it's filled with unrighteousness. Deadly poison it has the power to kill. I also want to address this morning, not only the words that we physically speak, but we live in a digital age. And with that, what that means is we can publish or write about anyone or anything anonymously through Twitter or X or whatever digital platform you may use. You could curse people out, send antagonistic messages. You can provoke hostility. You can just say your thoughts in whatever way that you want. We call trolling these days, another way to put it, it's slander. It's another form of slander. And so not only the physical words that we speak, but the way that we communicate also has consequences. Just think about your own life. I just think I was thinking about this past week. Imagine if someone recorded every single word that you spoke throughout this week. I don't know about you, but there will be moments where I would be very ashamed or regretful because of the words that sometimes come out of my mouth. What if that, what if throughout a week someone cuts you off in traffic or that fight that you get into with your spouse, your parent, your significant other, maybe the whisper of words that you say under your breath about your boss or your coworker, and it comes out in all different ways. It could be hateful comments, bursts of anger, degrading comments. Maybe it's an inappropriate lust that we verbalize. And if we're honest, we can be very embarrassed by some of the words that have come out of our mouths. And James is saying, because our tongues are untamable, which leads us to number three. The tongue reveals the depravity of our hearts. The tongue reveals the depravity of our hearts. Again, I'm going to read verses nine and on. James says, with it, which is our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. As James ends this passage, what he's saying is the, word, the words that we speak are a single best indicator of what's really in our hearts. Our words are like a gauge to what's going on in our hearts. And he uses this illustration of fruit. He's saying a plant that's planted will yield or produce the fruit that the plant is. So obviously, for example, if you plant an apple tree, it will, according to its nature, produce apples. You can't produce oranges on an apple tree. Salt water cannot flow out of fresh, a fresh spring. And so logically, the words that come out of my mouth or our mouths or an overflow of the content of our hearts. When we speak unkind, words that are filled with rage or hatred or even jealousy, we can often pass it by and say, that was a mistake. Or I didn't mean to say that. But James would argue, actually, it's what's really in our hearts. You see, there's a consistency between what's in your heart and what comes out of your mouth which is very humbling to think about. The words that we speak is an indicator of what's in our hearts. And perhaps our hearts are not as pure as we think because of the words that we speak. Or another way to put it, our word issues are actually heart issues. James is getting at the heart of the matter. It's not technique. It's not mistake of words but it actually is a heart issue that James is pointing out. Jesus will say the same thing. 
In Luke chapter six, verse 45, Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so again, if you see someone or maybe in your own heart, someone who's boastful or angry or critical, well, it's an indicator of what's really going on in their hearts. And he goes on and he says, from the same mouth can come blessing and cursing. What he's saying, there's a inconsistency because we bless God with our words and curse people who are made in the image of God. And he's saying, this cannot be so. There should be a consistency of when we come and worship God, the songs that we sung this morning, we worship you, we praise you. That's the same kind of words that we should speak of other people. But James is pointing out, with the same mouth that we use every Sunday morning to worship God, we often use it to curse people who are made in the image of God. I don't know if you ever had this experience on a Sunday morning. You come on a Sunday, you get blessed. You like the worship. Maybe God convicts you to the message. And you go right to your car. Maybe you get a phone call from a parent. Or you start arguing with your spouse. The way that plays out in my life is that I have to discipline my kids, right? Get your seatbelt on. No, we're not going there. We're going home. And with the same mouth that I just preached and worshiped God with, I start cursing people in my life. And James is saying, how can this be? This ought not be so. It's a big deal. We should not excuse the way that we use our words. The battle for our words is actually a battle for our hearts. So I want to say this, that our words are a lordship issue. If Jesus has lordship over my heart and my life, it will reflect in the way that I speak towards others. Every aspect of my life is under the authority of Jesus. Again, it, my finances, uh, my body, the way that I go about making decisions is all under the authority of Jesus, which also includes my words. So we need to ask ourselves, if we don't ever use words of grace and mercy and love, if our words never extend forgiveness to others, then I just want to ask us, have we really experienced the gospel? Again, the whole point of James is that, do you know the gospel? Because if you do, it will show by your works. And in this passage, James is saying, if our words reflect anything other than grace, mercy, forgiveness, then it goes back to maybe your religion is not that real. Maybe your, the gospel really hasn't affected you or gone deep into your heart. I love what Paul Tripp says, famous pastor and author. He says this, words belong to the Lord. What this means is that whenever you take words as belonging to you, your words lose their shelter from difficulty. You have never spoken a word that belongs to you because words belong to the Lord. We think that words are not that important because we think of words as little utilitarian tools for making our lives easier and more efficient when they are actually a powerful gift given by communicating God for its divine purpose. As we close, let me just leave us with some very practical bits of application. When it comes to our words, I first want to start off by saying, commit your speech that honors God and builds others up. May our words be committed so that it honors God and builds others up. Paul says in Ephesians 4.29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. We are called to use our words to bless Jesus, and to build up others. And so as we think about our speech, a couple of questions that came to mind. Are my words honoring to the Lord? Are my words honoring to the Lord? Second, does my word, do the words that I use bring life 
and build others up. Now, it doesn't mean that we are never called to speak hard truth. It doesn't mean that we're never called to rebuke others. That's not what James is getting at. But I believe the trajectory of our words should build others up and it should be one that honors God. Second, we need to ask the Lord that our hearts will be submitted to the work of the Holy Spirit. We need to ask the Lord that our hearts would be submitted to the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, as I said before, if our words are heart issues, the way that we should approach this passage is not just self-help or better technique, but the way that we should approach this passage is that we should ask the Spirit to take control of our hearts. Because if the spirit takes control of our hearts, then obviously, then our words will be different. If we have spoken ungodly words through confession and repentance, we ask the Holy Spirit to take control of our hearts and therefore our words. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul talks about the fruit of the spirit, what we should look like when we live a life under the gospel, he uses words like love and kindness and gentleness and self-control, which is all included in our words. When we are filled by this spirit, we speak the way of Jesus. And so I think a great place to start for all of us is to acknowledge our own helplessness. Maybe our words are out of control. And James is saying, that's obvious because no one can tame the tongue, but Jesus can. When we come under the authority of the Holy Spirit, Jesus can take control, not only of our hearts, but also of our words. Lastly, look to the one who gives life-giving words. In John chapter seven, verses 40, uh, chapter 7, verses 46, as these Pharisees and guards were talking with Jesus, one of the guards said this, never has anyone spoke like Jesus. They were astonished at the words of Jesus. If you think about the life of Jesus, Jesus never spoke one unnecessary word. He never spoke one untruthful word, one unkind word. Jesus' speech was filled with grace, wisdom, and mercy. He stole, he told people the truth. He spoke the truth in a completely loving way. And if you think about the life of Jesus, Jesus became a victim of words. He was scorned and condemned and mocked through words that were spoken to him. Jesus took the fire of hell so you and I could have the hope of heaven. Even at the very end, he spoke words of grace and forgiveness and mercy as our example. And when we see that, when we see the life of Jesus of what he has done for us, I believe gradually our words will be healed as well. And so let's be a community in church that honors God with our words and our tongue. My prayer for all of us as we go into this week comes from Psalm 1914. The Psalm writer writes this, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's bow our heads and pray as we close our time together.